So there will be times uh, when Sean will bring forward specific questions during the panel discussion, and he's free to interrupt any of us at any time. He's got that permission to go. And the idea is to let's have a discussion and not just a presentation and a series of presentations. So what are the topics? Well, of course, we're going to talk about the climate today and the venture capital climate and the opportunity for raising funds. What strategies are best? You know, and now it's interesting. When I frame this question, what strategies are best adopted in a post-COVID world? I don't think post-COVID is an accurate term, but that's a digression. We need a term that means in the new COVID world, because we don't see our way yet to a post-COVID world. So whenever you see post-COVID, please just translate that to mean in this new environment, which I don't think we have proper vocabulary for yet. What is the time frame for returning to normalcy? What is normalcy? What pivots are in order? And what are your priorities and concerns? So um, we do have a formal agenda with time frames, et cetera, and we will follow it as closely as possible. But the only part of the agenda I promise you we will hit exactly on time is going to be the time to adjourn. So in, between now and then, it's up for us to decide how we conduct ourselves. But I expect to give some opening remarks, uh, and then we're gonna go right into our fantastic panel and have, uh, for the whole uh, process, our panel is gonna be a resource for an open discussion that Sean and I will engage with you in. So, an introduction to myself, I'm not going to read you this slide. I'm not even going to tell you about it because if you're in this program, we've probably already met and you probably already have a good idea who I am. But and suffice it to say that like everybody else on the panel, I have a diverse background personally and everybody else will today too. Everybody who you are going to meet today and meet with has probably worked in big companies and startups and been an entrepreneur and an investor and an advisor to many. And this is just prototypical of all of us in this conference today, not just those of us on the panel, but probably many of us who are in attendance as well. So a fantastic panel. Uh, I'm, when we get to the panel and we, we turn to them, I'm gonna have each of them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, but I'll tell you, three of these folks are startup guys pure startup guys, and one of these guys is a growth financing guy. I'll let you figure out who, because three of these guys are Berkeley alums, and one of these guys went to some school back east. So, um, you know, see if you can mix, mix and match as we go through the day. That's just a little joke, Jeb, sorry about that. <laughs> so, you know, we're not just here alone. I want to just, you know, of course, recognize Sean, who's going to be with us throughout. And I want to recognize that this whole program is backed up by uh, UC Berkeley Executive Education, as represented today uh, by Manpreet Shahal, who many of you have probably met already, either uh, in some virtual way, because she's been responsible for arranging this and structuring it with her team. And she'll be here with us uh, throughout the day to make sure that the trains run on time and that this process actually works. So let's start with a poll. That's who's in the room. And these polls are gonna be pretty quick. You have to lean in. I want you to uh, you know, go in and if there are any questions, let's figure out how to work the polls now. But the poll is now open and I only want to keep it open for a maximum of 30 seconds, but it's, I wanna know who's in the room. I mean. And you only have to pick one, or put it this way, you can only, you can only pick one. Because I want you to decide, even though you've done many of these things, which is the thing that is the role you're in right now? Are you, you know, in a funded venture? Are you not for raising money? Are you a venture capital manager? Are you raising funds? I see we have 104 people online right now. 60 of you have responded. Uh, the polling is closed with 60, and um, interesting. I hope you can all see these results. Great group. There, there are have, people raising money right now. 
Yeah, right. And uh, 13% raising money. That's one. In, that's more than one in 10. That's fantastic. And of course, uh, so we have 50% who are either raising or uh, investing money from a uh, you know institutional fund. We have uh, you know over a third that are corporate strategics. Uh, and so we have a really great mix. Thanks. I want to capture that data uh, and remember it. Thank you, Sean. If you could capture that for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's just open that poll again. Can we do that and uh, not relaunch from zero, but give it another few seconds to see if it changes dramatically? Is that possible, Manpreet, to extend the opening of the poll without relaunching it from the beginning? No, unfortunately, Jerry, we would lose the other numbers. Oh, okay. So, okay, we'll take this as a um, as a result. You know what, let's just try this one more time. I'm gonna relaunch the polling and everybody who's answered, you'll have to re-answer, but I wanna see if we have, um, you know, if this is. Oh. If we get similar results. Very fast response time. See, see, we're, we're, we're getting uh, him trained. Already. Yeah, we're getting him trained. This is good. Uh, we're getting very similar results. Good. I'm going to assume that these are the accurate results. That's good, because we got very similar results. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate that. So we got a great group. We know who's in the room. OK, well, let's take this a step further. Um, let's figure out what you're interested in. Now, I tried to take the whole world and reduce it down to a few multiple choices, right? So let's launch this poll. And I just taken the whole world and I said, it's either B2B or B2C or life sciences, which includes all healthcare services or geographic regional focus. In other words, if you're in Saudi Arabia and you're interested in Saudi Arabian economic development, or uh, you know, if you're in uh, the European Union, but you're not focused on the European Union, but you're focused on B2B global, you would go, um, you know, in the first choice. So let's open this poll. And let's see where we're going. Okay, we have 32, 37, 50 responses. We're getting there. Keep it open for a while. Let's see if we can get to 100. Oh, I love this. Okay, so the results, let's call that end of polling here. Let's call that good. Uh, we have really, B to B, which is interesting. And I, I know there are gonna be a number of our panelists who are gonna be very interested in that. So, and a lot more life sciences than I might have, might have expected. And strong geographic regional focus. That's great, that's really important. Really important. Great, thank you. And uh, Sean, if I can ask you again to try and capture that. We'll come back to that. Great. So we know who's in the room. Now I want to try it, the same poll, the one right now. I want investors only. In other words, take the entrepreneurs out of the mix, and I want to see where our investors are at. So see if that's the same reflection. Investors only, give me uh, 15 seconds here. Lean in, lean in, go, go, go. Go, go, go. Yeah, we are getting similar results. Good, I'm ending the polling because it looks the same. Cool, thank you very much. So let's try stage. Everybody in the room, entrepreneurs included, uh, what stage do you represent or are in, most interested in? Can we launch that poll please, ma'am? Thank you. Give it a good 10, 15 seconds. Go, everybody. Okay. Oh, okay, you guys are getting really fast. We're up to 50 responses, 75 responses. Go, 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 go. Get in there. Early stage dominates. Okay, now let's look at investors only. Relaunch the poll, investors only. See if it reflects. Yeah, wow, does. 10 seconds, you got it. 
In 10 seconds, we got 70 responses. That's great. Okay, so we know who's in the room. We got a lot of B2B and a lot of early stage. This is going to be an exciting group. All right. So, you know, welcome to our home, right? We've all been here together. We've all spent time together at Berkeley. And now we're going to be at virtual Berkeley. And if we're sitting around in virtual Berkeley or we're sitting around in London or we're sitting around in New York, it doesn't matter. We're all seeing headlines that, you know, are pretty scary. And I don't need to read these to you, but this is what we live with every morning when we read the financial press. You know, banks are not lending, government's not spending, deficits are soaring, the Fed's printing money, debasing the dollar. I mean, this is murder. And then you come around just yesterday, right? And Airbnb is preparing for an IPO filing later this month. I mean, make sense of that, will you? In the face of this bad news, this is a crazy world we live in. And the same day, SoftBank confirms, oh yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're not making any new investments. Now we had heard that was coming, but um, you know, this is the salt and pepper of our daily lives. This is uh, the, the craziness that we have uh, to absorb and, and be uh, good investors with. So, you know, when you look at these metrics, and uh, I'm going to give reference now to PitchBook, which uh, is the source of any of this, the data we see that's on a blue slide. So I won't mention their name again, but thank you very much to them. Uh, you know, when we look at the macroeconomic picture, you don't need news from me. I mean, this is the unemployment spike that we have, uh, you know, absorbed incredibly. And you look at that uh, unemployment against uh, the loss of jobs, you know, in the venture capital sector, it's still massive. Now these firms are losing all these employees are not startups necessarily. I mean, these are later stage venture capital uh, funded companies, venture capital backed companies that had hundreds and hundreds of employees. But still, we have had massive layoffs in venture backed companies. Hey, Jerry, are you going to share these slides after? Uh, sure, absolutely. That's, I, I should have announced that perhaps. If anybody's interested in these slides, they will be posted and available to you. So, you know, when you look at you know, this horrible news, and you see it as a shock. I mean, it's like somebody, if you came along in February and said, hey, guess what? You know, in the next couple of months, 50,000 people in venture-backed companies are going to be out of work. In February, you would have said, crazy, we're going gangbusters, right? So it's like somebody hit you by, up on the side of the head. Well, you're talking about being hit up by the side of the head. This is where we're sitting today. You know, this is us. We're sitting at desks and we're looking at you know, a lot of people and we spend our whole day doing this. And this is another way of being hit up by the side of the head. Our lives are different. The new normal focuses around Zoom and Netflix and Amazon and food delivery, right? So we all know the message of shock creates disruption and over, you know, and disruption overcomes inertia and you have, you know, this disruption. Well, you know, the case example that hits Sean and I right between the eyes, you know, Zoom University. And, you know, Berkeley, uh, Harvard, or the local community college, I don't care. They're all sort of ubiquitous Zoom experiences. The, the product differentiation is harder to maintain over the long term when we have the Zoomification of the world. So, you know, higher, you know, higher education is just one example. The old world, content is king. You know, the new world, the process matters. The content is there, but the context really matters. You know, Generation Z, we were calling it Generation Z before it was, you know, Generation Zoom. But I'm hearing the joke from uh, more and more folks that, you know, they're attending Zoom University. Well, the punchline for that was when one of my students sent me this picture that, hey, you know, I don't need to go to the bookstore to get a T-shirt. I can, I can show you I'm attending Zoom University. Look, I've got the T-shirt, right? 
So what are these shocks you know, that, that, that cause disruption? Sometimes they're purposeful shocks, like X Prize, a $10 million privately funded prize to stimulate uh, commercial use of outer space and space travel. I mean, it worked, right? But the classic view, you know, is this idea of incremental change. And you and have already learned this process when you attended class about the sweet spot of uh, innovation and the waves of innovation and how they would go from, you know, university to mature enterprise using the venture capital community and the entrepreneurial process as a way to create high potential innovative firms. But that view, you know, is still true, creating these waves of innovation that we've all come to understand. But what I want to jump to is this slide, which is the pace of these waves. This is the first derivative, right? If you go back to these waves, which, you know, if we've all taken my, you know, our venture capital class and our, uh, you know, these waves, I don't have to go through them today. But if you look at them, the duration of these waves is shorter and shorter and shorter. So COVID, you know, the spike here is a straight line up. The disruption is just as large, perhaps. Well, the question, the question is, is the disruption just as large? But certainly the pace is huge. So my question number one for the panel, and so we're going to introduce the panel and then ask this question. How should we understand this disruption? I mean, if you look at it as a global process, clearly the word pandemic means that it's a global process. It's intrinsic. So how profound is it going to be? Is it something that's going to go away? Or is it here for a, a long time? Is this a, a healthcare challenge or an economic challenge? Clearly, it's both, right? But does the how should we put our priorities? And what is the cause and effect? And does this create opportunities? And can we find a way to create value for society and economic value for our constituents with this challenge. So V, W, L, et cetera, et cetera, does it matter? How does that matter? How does that translate into venture capital strategy? So I'll briefly uh, introduce you to Noah Doyle, Cable Desai, Jeb Miller, and Larry Marcus, all of whom have been wonderful contributors to our venture capital program over the years. I would like to ask each of them first before they address this question to take a quick pass through and introduce themselves and their firm strategy just as an introduction and then we'll get into answering the question. So Noah, could I ask you to go first please? Absolutely. Um... My name is Noah Doyle. I am um, uh, the co-founder of Javelin Venture Partners, and uh, I'm a, a multi-time entrepreneur. Uh, started my entrepreneurial career as a student of Jerry's in uh, his class, and uh, the project that uh, I and ultimately my co-founders um, of a company that became My Points uh, chose to take the class to do a plan for an idea and proceeded to get funded and uh, uh, ultimately go public, um, sell the company to United Airlines. And I went on to start two other companies in India, uh, the second of which is the largest loyalty program in India, uh, Payback India, and uh, um, proceeded then to invest and join a team called Keyhole, which was building a 3D digital model of the earth, was acquired by Google as uh, Google's third acquisition, and that team became the Geo team uh, that built out Google Earth, Google Maps, um, Maps for Mobile, and uh, all the Google uh, local business center products. Um, uh, went on to uh, start Javelin after leaving Google, and we were 
uh, early stage seed to series A fund um, on our uh, fourth fund uh, currently and um, have made about 70 investments um, across uh, emerging technologies. We look for uh, disruptive technologies that are capital efficient and scalable. Um, and uh, our, some of our better known companies are uh, Thumbtack, uh, marketplace for service professionals with uh, um, 500,000 uh, paying professionals and uh, Masterclass, um, the uh, streaming uh, service for um, the world's best experts to connect with consumers who want to learn, educate and entertain. Um, so that's a quick overview. And uh, should should I say something about the your the topic now, or yeah, let's get hold through that. the intros let's first? The, okay, let's right. get the intros done. Thank you very much, Noah. Okay, well, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, Jerry. Hi, everyone. It's great to be part of this program and uh, see some familiar names. Uh, I'm sitting here in sunny San Francisco, which is the beginning of our summer. So it's uh, it's a great time to be here despite all everything that's going around us. Um, briefly, my background, I've been uh, in Silicon Valley for 30 years now, and the first 20 years were spent on the operating side, uh, working in companies, mostly small companies, all venture backed as an engineer product uh, manager. Uh, I started a company in the dot-com era, it was an online payment company uh, that we sold to First Data. Uh, and then I ended up at Google in the mid 2000, uh, went through the IPO and uh, got a chance to learn how to build products at scale for billions of people worldwide. Um, and then I shifted to the investment world, uh, which is where I've been for the last nine years. Uh, I'm also a student of Cal and Jerry's classes. Uh, I joined uh, Haas in 99 as part of the 97, sorry, as part of the full-time MBA program. Uh, launched the business competition at UC Berkeley, which was the first accelerator in the Bay Area at the time. It's still going on 20 years later. And have done a variety of things uh, with Jerry and Sean over the years, uh, helping teach some of the classes in uh, venture capital and entrepreneurship. Uh, my day job is I'm a general partner at IntraWest. IntraWest is a early stage venture capital firm. Uh, we've been around for 40 years, raised 10 funds, uh, over $3 billion of assets under management, uh, we raised, every time we raise a fund, we do half of that investments in the healthcare sector, bio, um, biotech companies, medical devices, healthcare IT. And then the other half is in, uh, in what we call uh, IT or technology companies. All of them at an early stage, early for us, meaning seed and series A. Uh, I also uh, recently started a new venture firm called Shakti Capital, which is a continuation of uh, my tech strategy into a new standalone tech only platform. And um, again, I'm an early stage investor there. Uh, some of the companies that I've been involved with over the years uh, as an investor, uh, we have a company called Canva, which is a uh, company based in Sydney, Australia that develops um, software for consumers and businesses to do design and publishing. Uh, we have a company called The Real Real, which is a e-commerce marketplace for luxury consignment. It's a company that went public last year. Uh, and we have a variety of other software companies uh, that provide infrastructure technology to um, other companies in primarily three markets on the tech side, commerce, uh, media, and transportation or mobility. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Jeb. Hi, Jerry. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeb Miller, and I'm with a venture firm uh, called Icon Ventures which back when we had offices was based between Palo Alto and San Francisco. So focused primarily on the West Coast. Uh, we are a Series B, Series C specialty fund, which is a bit unusual. Looks like most of you are very familiar with the venture ecosystem. And most venture firms uh, gen tend to take the barbell approach of investing very early, high risk, high reward, or late stage. We like to describe ourselves as the skinny little bar in between the barbell uh, plates. But we've built a practice here. It's about a 15 year old firm. We've got a billion under management, um, focused primarily on software companies, uh, B2B, uh, some B2C and uh, increasingly more health IT. Uh, I joined the venture business in the wonderful year of 2001, um, which not unlike this time was a highly disruptive time. I had been at a, an accelerator company called Scient prior to that, um, that had launched uh, a couple dozen early B2C e-commerce companies 
uh, during that dot-com wave. It was a pretty uh, awesome experience. We went public, got to a 10 billion market cap and went bankrupt in uh, 18 months. So it saved me going to business school to learn that in uh, from professors and schools. I learned that the hard way um, to the ups and downs of that business. But so I've been in the venture business for about 20 years now. Um, our firm uh, tends to focus on helping companies scale uh, once the kind of product market fit tech risk is out of the business and we help companies ramp. We have uh, business development capabilities to help companies uh, grow both domestically as well as in the Japan market. And our two most recent IPOs, which have been very fortuitous um, in this environment were uh, Teladoc, which was the pioneer of the whole telemedicine trend, um, which has seen a uh, massive adoption as you've all been aware. And then bill.com, which is an online bill payment uh, company, which likewise uh, has been uh, very well received in the public markets. Well, Jeff, I have to give you a shot across the board because I know you were a polo player. We were talking about that earlier, uh, water polo. Uh, but, you know, that may not be that untypical background for venture capital. I don't know. But what was your major in college? I was an economics major at Harvard. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, like economics. Is that what we're talking about today? It is. I mean, seriously, when you studied economics, I think we're right in that zone today. Tell, tell me about, why don't I ask you to answer this question first? How should we understand this disruption? Yeah, if I could go back and fudge my uh, resume, I would have been a data scientist or a, uh, a big data expert, right? Because it uh, would have been very timely. But so I think, you know, having gone through now, I guess this is my third major um, disruption uh, from the venture capital business. Um, and I'm by no means an expert on the macro climate, right? And it's always hard to study an environment when you're in the midst of a storm. Um, but uh, this has been a very unprecedented experience, very unlike anything we have gone through before by the nature of how globally, globally pervasive it is and how much of a disruptive, shocking impact that we've gone from. Like, I think in your prelude, you mentioned, if you go back to March 1st, when we were sitting and planning for the year and planning for the outcomes of our portfolio and fundraising and debating how long the blitz scaling, you know, grow at all costs model was going to survive and um, thinking about uh, how we, you know, pour more capital into our businesses and debating whether WeWork's model was going to work and whether SoftBank's vision fund was going to be able to raise their second fund. It seems like a very distant memory, right? And I do feel like um, this environment, you made a great point earlier as well, that I think this is the new normal. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to go back to where we were. There have been some really significant fundamental changes to how business is being done and how um, companies are scaling that I think we need to all adapt and adjust to. And we have done that, you know, through cycles in the past, and I think we'll do it again on the, you know, where I'm very optimistic and where I, I think um, we're seeing a, a kind of surprise on the upside is we all felt like, you know, like I said, in my preview, about half our companies are selling into enterprises. Uh, we thought Q2 was going to be a really difficult quarter um, with, you know, the shock being fully absorbed and big changes of the business. And our companies have been surprisingly resilient and, uh, I've been really impressed with the way uh, companies, big, small startups, uh, big companies have learned to adapt and continue to execute and build and grow in a really tough environment. And especially the workforce, like the ability of teams to rally and support each other and work in an entirely, you know, remote Zoom environment. It's been really, um, it's been really gratifying to watch how people have adapted and it kind of shows the uh, ability of entrepreneurs and um, uh, tech ex execs to to adapt to different environments. I've, I've really enjoyed watching that. So I'm actually very optimistic. I think we're fortunate in the tech industry that a lot of the trends are actually pulling forward the need for um, uh, technology solutions and approaches in this new normal. You know, software has always been, been about automating processes and um, taking out inefficiency. And I think in a lot of markets that's been accelerated. You know, I'll point back to Teladoc. When we were working with that company early on, we were fighting state by state to allow, you know, medicine to be uh, delivered uh, via phone or via video. It took, you know, tons of regulatory effort. And now I think it's the new normal, right? I think people would much prefer to avoid uh, going into the ER unless it's for true emergencies and, uh, you know, just a totally new way of delivering service. And I think, you know, we're fortunate that, uh, that our industry, I think, is going to be very resilient. And I'll stop there because as a venture capitalist, I love to talk as we all do, and I don't want to hog all of the time. So let me defer to others now. That's kind of you, Jeb. 
but that was very helpful. I, I just want to give recognition that Larry Marcus, I don't believe, is with us. Uh, is that correct, Manpreet? Is it Larry has not been able to register? Yeah, yeah, unless he speaks up right now, we haven't seen him. Okay, good. Larry just raised a new fund with Jay Z, so he's probably out doing more interesting things than this call. <laughs> Nothing's more interesting than being with us. <laughs> I just got it. I just got to notice Larry um, scheduled it for the wrong time, so his apologies. Okay, well, bye, Larry. So good, we're great. Uh, so let, let's go back in reverse order. So Cable, uh, without jumping the shark on everything we want to discuss today, just how do you see uh, this disruption? I think there are three dimensions to this, uh, Jerry. Uh, there is the healthcare, the biological dimension. Uh, there is the uh, general economy GDP dimension. And then there is the opportunity value creation dimension, which is really the venture capital lens on it. And I think that we have to be uh, in order respectful uh, and be very, very uh, humble about the biology of this virus. And I think that, that you know, we're still in the obviously first inning of what's been a global pandemic and we're learning every day. So I think that when it comes to the biology and uh, the long-term effects of this virus, I think we are, we're not sure yet. We know it's going to be dramatic. We know obviously, we know it has created a lot of uh, destruction and disruption across the world. Um, but in terms of the long-term healthcare effects, I think we don't know. So I think that's the first dimension. Uh, clearly, in terms of the impact on GDP, I think across the world, you know, in March, April, May, everybody took a big hit. And now I think what we're seeing in the beginning of Q3 is that different economies are emerging out of it with very different pace of recovery. China, for example, is already back mostly to its uh, pre-COVID uh, era of growth and consumption. Uh, parts of Europe are recovering faster. And then I think America is a tale of two stories where the stock market is way ahead of the actual real economy. Uh, and then the last dimension, which I think is the focus for all of us here in this call today is opportunity recognition and value creation when what comes out of that. And I think I agree with Jeb that for the most part in the, both in the healthcare and the tech sectors uh, that most of our audience is involved with right now, um, I think it's, an, it's a boom time. And it's boom time because what COVID has really done in my view is that it's accelerated the shift from a economy of proximity where we used to do things with, with you know, close proximity of each other to an economy of distance. And that shift had already started in, in some sectors even 20 years ago, for example, e-commerce, right? If you think about the Amazon and eBay era, which started in the late 90s, uh, that was a long time ago when people started buying things online. But even today, at the beginning of 2020, first quarter, if you look at the first quarter numbers, e-commerce in the US is only 12%, less than 12% of the total retail market. So after 20 years of digitization in a multi-trillion dollar industry, we're only 12%. And all of a sudden now COVID is accelerating that. So I think that 12% going to 24% is not gonna take another 20 years. I think that acceleration is gonna be much more rapid ex exponential. And you know, Jeff talked about uh, telehealth. So I think long story short, in terms of opportunity recognition, value creation, this is a boom time. And I think all of us who are in that business are going to be quite happy. And I would say, look back at this, not even 10, but five years from now and say, wow, that was one of the best time across the world for wealth creation and value creation. You know, venture capitalists are always said to be uh, opportunists or optimistic in any case. <laughs> You're definitely speaking for that side of it. Noah, uh, in brief, how should we see this moment? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, agree with, um, what Jeb and Cable, um, have said. And, uh, you know, I think, I think it is, um, you know, going back to that, uh, the, the barbell analogy, um, you know, it's definitely in the real world, uh, in real economy, um, a, a big barbell impact. Um, you have sectors like travel, uh, which have been utterly decimated and um uh are contracting um you have uh you know ma major unemployment um that 
uh, has, has really impacted, you know, especially in those sectors and has tended to be on the, the lower income um, uh, segment of the workforce. Um, and then any aspect of business that um, required virtualization or distance or digitization uh, has seen a rush of, uh, of adoption. Uh, actually, you know, ed, ed, in ed tech as well, you know, any, any remote learning tool, you know, has um, seen a rush of adoption. And I, I think, you know, this, this session is a, is a great example. Example, a great you know. example. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know, I know uh, Haas and uh, across the Berkeley campus, um, uh, the, uh, the staff and uh, professors were rushing to figure out how they were going to, you know, deliver a learning experience and um, have uh, gone out and, and fired up a bunch of initiatives, um, which are creating, you know, demand and, and business opportunities for a variety of companies. And that's happening, you know, at every school in the country. Uh, and around the world, um, uh, so I, th I, th I think in a way, you know, um, <clears throat> the the tech sector right now is benefiting, um, but there is going to be, you know, sort of a, a second wave of impact in the real economy as the reduction in demand, you know, works its way through. Um, yeah. if trade is taking a hit as well, and that's going to also, you know, reduce demand. Um, so I think, you know, as, as uh, Jeb mentioned, we, we saw some of the same patterns in our portfolio that uh, Q2 in the B2B companies um, actually was pretty solid. Um, however, uh, there was most of the activity was a carryover from their previous marketing and sales pipeline efforts and new pipeline generation suffered. And it's going to be much harder uh, to hit their growth uh, targets, uh, you know, Q3, Q4, Q1, um, and uh, I think um, I think we're just beginning to kind of see, you know, that second wave of impacts, and uh, you know, we we do need to be ready. Um, I, I know a lot of companies uh, had taken cost-cutting measures, and uh, some are now actually undoing them. So, you know, we we had uh, some of our cloud companies um, uh, kind of cut back on staff and hiring. Uh, in, in March and April, and now they're reopening recs and they're like rushing to hire people. Um, okay. But it, that may be a little bit a little bit too soon. You know, we'll see. Um, my advice on my boards is to take it step by step and take it a little bit slow in terms of ramping. You know, back up to that aggressive growth cost structure, um, and uh, let let it be a little bit more demand led. You know, than it was uh, at the at the beginning of the year. Right. That's, you know, that's very good advice. And let's get our uh, participants' point of view on this time frame, uh, you know, as a segue off of your comment. So if we can launch the poll. Um, from an, The poll is from an investor perspective. Okay, lean in. Everybody's going to have 15 to 30 seconds to respond. Uh, from a venture capitalist perspective, when do you expect the world to return to normal? Your choices are, of course, this is normal. Good luck. Or six months, one year, year and a half, or beyond, right? So is it something we can try and time out, or is it something we have to sort of adjust to now? And, you know, we're, I'm seeing with, a, what, 75, 80 responses, I'm seeing people feeling like it's a year and a half to two years, but I'm not seeing a predominance, you know, 22% say longer than two years. Um, with 90 responses, but really most is sort of a bell curve toward the later end. So people are not saying that this is a permanent situation. Interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, so this is something that they think they're going to work their way through. So if, we're, if it is a cycle that you're going to work your way through, I mean, the question comes up for me uh, is, is this something that you know, we've seen before. Is this an economic cycle thing? It, what kind of shock is it? Uh, is it a triage and curate situation like we had in 2001 and perhaps in 2008? Uh, or is it, uh, you know, a long-term capital formation challenge, which I think is more what uh, Cable is addressing? Uh, you know, will history repeat? 
And uh, as a, to frame that question, let me just give you some data. Uh, this again is a pitch book analysis. And I think it's interesting because pitch book, this is their information that essentially they're preparing for the institutional investor audience, right? And what they've done, in a, in, and this information again will be disseminated uh, afterwards, but they put out a fairly thoughtful piece, but in their entire piece, what they're doing is they're saying, let's look at, you know, the land, the, the, you know, the 2008 crisis, the great financial crisis. And they're saying, we think we're going to see those patterns replicate. And, you know, therefore we're going to predict the future that's going to look like the past and we can learn from the past and, uh, use that to anticipate what this cycle will look like. And that's really fundamentally uh, the question, whether the past is predicate. So uh, with that, without you know, uh, being concerned about exactly what these stats are, uh, because they're all the usual, deal activity, funds raised, employment, et cetera, uh, the question is really, will history repeat? So, um, what you, in, in brief, how much do you think this is like 2001, 2008? And let's try and just give this a quick shot. And uh, let's change up the order. Cable, let me ask you to go first. Yeah, I don't think this will, this will I don't think history will repeat. Uh, I, clearly, it is a shock like any other prior shocks in the sense that we have had a massive disruption in a very short amount of time. Um, this will be my fourth recession in Silicon Valley. And if I look at the prior three, 1991 was an oil shock from the first Gulf War. 2000 was a dot-com crash. And then 2008 was the global financial crisis. I think there are three things that are different this time. First is that the federal policymakers, both on the monetary side and to the large extent on the fiscal side, have really learned their lessons from the past recessions. And if you look at the monetary policy, in the US, but across the world, it's, I think it's just the most ideal textbook response that you could have had in terms of making sure that, that the supply of money is plentiful and interest rates are low. So I think that that has really helped us transition from the immediate impact of the recession way better than any of the past uh, prior recessions that I've seen here. So that's number one. I think number two, Looking forward, I think what is really different this time compared to even 2008, which was just you know 12 years ago, is that the addressable market, the TAM for all of our companies, whether they're in tech or healthcare, is just humongous. It's you know 100 times larger than what it was 10 years ago because everybody now has a smartphone in their pocket. So right, the addressable market for anything that touches technology is humongous. It's, you know, 5 billion people on the planet with smartphones compared to 100 million homes with broadband internet 10 years ago. So I think that makes the opportunity set much, much bigger. And I think the third thing that's different now is that thankfully for, for everyone in, in this business, I think entrepreneurship has become mainstream. If you think about, you know, sort of the- Absolutely. Right? I mean, software <laughs> eating the world, but I think what's, what's not being recognized largely is that entrepreneurship is eating the wall in the sense that, you know, it used to be a crazy idea for a college kid to drop out of college or, or even finish their college and then go start a company. The most safe thing most people did in the world was go join Microsoft or Google or Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. And now the most fashionable, cool thing to do is to start a company. And I think that's generally a good thing because the world at large is understanding how to do resource allocation uh, at, at a very macro level really well. And that again means that the actual impact of this recession on individuals, I hope is gonna be much, much less in the long run. Clearly it's very high in the short run, but in the long run, I think because of resource allocation, entrepreneurial activities and almost infinite supply of capital, I think this recession recovery will be very, very different than any of the prior ones. Even in supply of capital, especially when the U.S. government just prints it, right? Absolutely. And every other government in the world, for that matter. Yeah, Cable makes some great points. I mean, living through the last couple of uh, downturns, you know, the markets froze and the exit opportunities for startups and tech companies really were impacted. And that impacted the whole flow of capital. And I think here, 
one, the public markets have been surprisingly resilient and uh, resilient. Resilient. Yeah. There's been more. Ca- yeah. Is that the word? That's, that's probably not the academically correct term. Sorry. Um, resilient. Yeah. Uh, we're, hey, we're benefiting from it. It's like a perfect climate for venture capitalists, right? Because there's all this disruption and opportunity to invest on the front end, and then the exit markets are still super healthy on the back end. So it's rare that you find that opportunity, actually. So I think that, you know, there, there has been no slowdown in the, you know, availability of capital, the deployment of capital. I think if you look at relative places to invest, you know, high growth technology, U.S. businesses is a pretty attractive place relative to any other um, you know, investment opportunity right now. So I think the massive uh, supply of capital is going to help fuel this system going forward as well. So, so I echo what Cable said. I think that um, the tech industry, I think, will be fairly resilient through here. One thing that I do worry about um, is, you know, notwithstanding the, you know, the young uh, up and coming professors like Jerry, who are willing to embrace technology, uh, Zoom and polling and the like, I do worry about the education system. And the one pocket where I have not seen that um, ability to adapt and be flexible and, and uh, thrive in this new world is an education. We've got to get our kids back to school and back to a normal environment, which impacts the labor force that, you know, has to deal with uh, working while supporting kids at home and, you know, poten- the potential. Oh, let me call you out. So are you invest? So what are you doing about investing there? Does that affect your investment strategy? Uh, I think it's, I mean, again, we're opportunists and capitalists. So we have investments in things like Quizlet, which is an online learning tool, which has had widespread adoption. I I don't know how to break the stubbornness of, um, particularly in like the K through 12 union uh, inability to adapt to a new world. Uh, That's a hard one. Venture capitalists have tried for a long time in ed tech to try to crack that. That's been a hard one, but I think we'll keep trying. Okay, got it. Noah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think clearly we're in an, the, this unprecedented, you know, circumstance where, you know, tech, tech companies, which were already the stock market darlings have benefited from the pandemic in many ways, you know, not entirely, but in many ways. And, um, uh, there's, there's been a, um, uh, actually a swell of interest from retail investors um, in uh, um, preserving capital through the, through stock investing um, to react to that. You know, I think Zoom's the classic example. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's caused a rush to find the next Zoom in the public markets. You know, and, I just to interrupt on Zoom for a second. I was yeah. uh, in Barcelona in March with a very experienced limited partner uh, somebody who invests, uh, you know, hundreds of millions at a shot. And they were saying, this was March 6th, and it was just onset. And they said, wow, I wish I had invested in Zoom. But, you know, even at that moment, nobody was seeing Zoom had like doubled or something in a week. Nobody saw that it was going to just continue to fly in terms of valuation. So I, I'm only commenting, is the future can the future sustain this kind of multiple valuation growth? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, his, his, history would tell us otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it, you know, can a company, if it's trading at, you know, 60, 70, even a hundred times revenue, as some of these businesses are, you know, it, it, it needs to, you know, there are stupendous growth expectations built in and a few of them may well achieve it, but what you tend to see is that um, uh, on average, you know, the market won't wait and it's not a straight up path, even if a company does ultimately, you know, get to a scale where it justifies it, it's not going to be a straight line. Um, and there's going to, there are going to be significant gyrations. Um, you know, I, I think the other, you know, a little bit artificial, you know, element that we're experiencing is that um, because of the advent of, you know, certain major disruptors, you know, um, uh, Amazon and cloud, you know, um, uh, Uber and transportation, you know, Airbnb and, and travel, you know, there's, there's just been a, uh, you know, an, an influx of interest in venture capital, you know, both from existing LPs who, un, who have long-term horizons and that's fine. Um, but, you know, the, corporate venture capital, you know, demand has jumped a lot. 
um, CVCs are in about a quarter to a third of all um, fundraisers right now. And uh, historically, um, there tends to be a, a, a cycle with corporate venture that when it looks like startups are a threat, uh, every company wants to make sure they have a strategy. And, you know, uh, if, if, the, if they realize that, okay, you know, we have defenses and scale works and, you know, investing in these seed companies that take 10 years to produce anything, you know, meaningful in terms of a BD relationship isn't worth our time. <laughs> Everyone who did that investment is on to the next job, you know, then the interest tends to fade. Um, you know, I think you, there's also just uh, so much capital, you know, has gone into unicorns. Um, you know, if every unicorn exited at 3x its valuation, you know, would, it would be something like two and a half trillion dollars of, uh, of exit value. And, you know, there's, there's going to be disappointment in yeah. the, in the venture world and there's, there's no escaping it. So I think, I think it's not going to be a straight up kind of back to happy times scenario. So, so thank you. You know, I brought up this slide to make, uh, follow on your point, but this slide shows is the, um, amount of um, venture capital influence that's come from non-traditional sources. In other words, CV, you know, people are considering non-traditional being CVC and um, uh, other sources. So uh, the question is, are these people in it for the long term? Because you, you raise that issue about how there's turmoil uh, to just build into the corporate investor piece. And then the sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, not to tout something I just did, but on September 2nd, I'm going to have a new article released on the role of sovereign wealth funds, uh, you know, in the venture capital community and technology investing in general. And the real question is, are they long-term players or are they trend followers, right? So can they, uh, will this, in general, will the market be more disrupted Will trends swing like a pendulum more so because people who don't have a history of sticking with the sector or are not long-term players in the sector at this point, will they exit faster? As they have in the past, corporates have been very volatile, right? So that's a question. So I want to raise that question with the audience, if you will, I shouldn't call it audience, with our group. So if you'd lean in for a moment, everybody, and respond to this poll, which participants in the venture capital ecosystem you expect will have the most responsive and dynamic ability to respond, okay? Is it the entrepreneurs, the managers, people raising new funds? You know, are they gonna be changing their stories? Are they gonna be new funds that are appropriate for the new model, if there is a new model? Are the LPs gonna be responsive? Or are they gonna be more bureaucratic? And especially how about the corporate strategic investors are we opportunistic uh, or optimistic, pardon me, about their opportunity to be opportunistic. So let's see, we have 50 people responding. Come on, we need to pick up the pace, 65. Okay, when we get to 100, I'm good. Okay, we got 75 or so. Okay, we, in general, with 80 people responding, we think it's entrepreneurs. We generally think they're going to be the trendsetters, that they're going to be the ones most responsive. Okay, thanks for that. That's, that's a very clear signal. Uh, can, it's can I interject? People... Can yeah, I go interject? ahead, please. Yes. Sure. Just, just on, on this particular point um, of who's going to be responsive and dynamic, you know, one of the things that I've been saying um, to, to people is really the, the key to the response is going to be be uh, when we can accurately forecast into the future, whether you're an entrepreneur or a VC, like we'll know we've reached the bottom and we can predict what's going to happen in the future when we can forecast what we think individual companies are going to do, then capital will start to flow. I mean, it may be off a new normal that's lower than the existing normal, but I think the uncertainty is part of the thing that is driving um, the, uh, the, the struggle that we're having right now. I'd only say one, th one thing about that, Sean, yep. which is that I agree forecast, but I don't think forecasts are ever right. Like I'm sure you don't either. We've shared the podium enough to know that. 
So it's when we believe we can forecast, not so much when we can forecast, but when we believe we believe we can forecast. Right? That, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And while I've while I've interjected, um, we've got a couple of questions from the good. from the crowd. When do you when do you want those? No, throw them up right now. I've got a pace I want to maintain, but go okay. For it. Let's let's see if we can um, uh, manage this. I'd like to unmute um, a, a couple people. So if, if somebody can can do that, I want to start with Darren Sabo. Um, uh, Darren's got a question for the panel. Hi, I was wondering what you thought the effect of the November elections will have on the economic recovery and the investment. Um, yeah, the, the, just the in general investment landscape. So who, anybody want to grab that one? I'm going to raise your hand and go for it. Go ahead, Cable. So there's a, there's a lot of research uh, going back more than 100 years that shows that U.S. presidential elections generally don't have any impact on value creation uh, and venture returns. Uh, and the re there are two, two reasons for that. One, as we all know, venture funds have a 10-year horizon. We're in a vintage, not in a day trading market. So our horizon uh, is long enough that we can we can absorb any near term uh, shocks. The second reason is that, as Sean and Jerry alluded to, markets the, the markets are very good at pricing in uh, risk. What they're very bad at is uncertainty. So as long as there is clarity about the positioning of either of the presidential candidates, which there is, both campaigns have. Uh, mostly publish their views on taxation, economic policy, uh, and, and things of that nature, that the markets are able to price those things in. And to Jerry and Sean's point, once it's priced in, participants can react to that and make their decisions accordingly. So I expect that there will not be a major impact either way. There will, I mean, depending on who gets, certainly if, the, if Biden wins, taxes will go up. No question about that. Um, other than that, but but taxes going up has not affected venture returns in the past. Anybody else need to jump on that one? Jerry, well, who's your polling say is going to win? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. But look, I was sure last time. I was confident last time. We, were all, we all were. So I'll, I'll, I'll echo Cable's point. The other uh, pause for concern that we have in the industry is the immigration policy is killing us. So. Um, right. With a new regime or with the current regime, we have got to reopen up the immigration policy because there's so much innovation and entrepreneurship and risk taking that comes out of the immigrant um, ecosystem that we need we need to uh, continue to push for that fight. Absolutely, thank you for that point. I, no, I, okay. I would just add also that the tech ecosystem really depends on free trade. Uh, we have yeah. a in globally integrated supply chain and. Um, the uh, this de deglobalization is definitely a significant negative for the yes. entire economy, but definitely for the tech sector. So I think, you know, in that sense, a, a return to normalcy in the White House will will benefit, you know, uh, the real economy, you know, and the stock market ultimately. The only the, can I take a slightly counter on that, Jerry? Go for it. You know, I agree with I agree with Noah and, and and generally on the free trade thing. The only place I think that actually could benefit tech in the U.S. is the return of the manufacturing industry in tech, which is semiconductors and Semi, yeah, I, it, semiconductors. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that Intel gave up fab building 15 years ago uh, and TSMC is the only player in town that that will be I think will likely be reversed, no matter who gets elected. And by the way. Uh, Biden administration, I don't think is going to be any more friendly to China than the Trump is. I, I just, I just have to um, very quickly bring up Kamal Hassan's point here in the chat. As a Canadian, I'd like to thank the U.S. for your immigration policy. <laughs> Sean, is there somebody else you want to call out in the chat before we move? Uh, there's to a this? yeah. There's there's another question that I think it's after the next question you're going to ask the panel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let's move to question number three then. Uh, you know. Talking about politics, the segue couldn't be better, right? Everybody else <laughs> had a plan, right? So, you know, what's your plan? Yeah, before COVID, this is a chart, you know, from uh, 
uh, CB Insights about, oh, what's hot, right? And this is a chart right before, this is a February chart, right? So I, I pick it on purpose because, you know, this is what was you know, supposed to be hot this decade. You know, well, good luck with that. Uh, you know, what is hot, you know, in your perspective? You've, ad you've addressed it a little bit, but if you can hit it real quick where you think uh, the touch points are. I, I see that, um, I see Douglas is online. I mean, if I was to call on Douglas, he would tell me it's healthcare because he's just made a great investment in, uh, uh, you know, a new uh, therapy a vaccine company that's going to save the world, you know, one of the hundred. But, you know, sure enough, it's going to be, you know, hopefully a great one. But, I mean, who would have ever thought vaccines? Vaccines used to be the place you ran away from, right? Because it was no recurring business. So, I mean, what is hot now? Has that changed? Go for it. Uh, Noah, why don't you start? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think in in our portfolio and in in the you know companies we're talking to for fundraisers, um, uh, definitely SaaS and um, especially cloud infrastructure. Um, there's been a just a overnight movement um, away from on premise. Uh, you know, it, it was happening already, quite similar to the e-commerce effect for retail. That you know was a it was a long term trend. Public cloud you know already you know was emerging as a you know more reliable, lower cost you know easier way to deploy applications for enterprise. Um, uh, but um, a lot of uh, there was a lot of inertia around the installations of existing equipment and ways of doing things. And suddenly, when you you know j just to bring people into the office, you know get people into a data center have physical access to equipment became, you know, came, was called into question. Public cloud was not an option anymore. And every single large company is, uh, is, is requiring that move to public cloud and so companies that facilitate it. Yeah. I, I know I just want to jump on that for a second. If I generalized off that point, uh, not just talking about the cloud, but you know, there's an argument that is often made that, uh, the technology disruptions and technology platform changes were already in place or already in place. They're two long-term timeframes that this disruption doesn't change it. It accelerates the adoption of certain things. And that's, you know, public cloud ar you know, argument. And so I want to move to Jeb and, and to Cable, if I may, and just ask you, do you have counter examples or are you going to make more of that case that, you know, is it trends that were in place get accelerated? Or do you actually see new opportunities and new, and new threads or micro markets that didn't, like vaccines, you know, didn't exist, right? Jeb, I'm gonna hit you first. Sure, um, so I would echo Noah entirely. Like I, I think a lot of the trends we were investing behind are the same and are accelerating. A lot of what has been of interest to the venture community has been vertical market solutions that are embracing modern tech stacks, cloud, big data, machine learning, more automation. And I think that's only been accelerated here, right? Another thing I'm super optimistic and positive about is for all the heat the big companies have taken in front of Congress, like the internet infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure has been awesome, right? I mean, talk about a shock to the system when you have like 30% spike in traffic uh, at all times and you have a family of four all on Zoom at the same time. The fact that the internet has held up through all of this and the uh, the cloud providers, even the bandwidth providers, like it's been pretty phenomenal how they've responded there and how we've been able to support the, you know, massive um, adoption of uh, uh, video cloud commerce and all the like. So I think all those trends are just going to accelerate, which is awesome. I do think, you know, there are certainly pockets. I, we're not, you know, deep healthcare um, experts, but we do focus on the health IT side. And I think, you know, trying to finally break down this archaic medicine system that we have here and the need to go to a primary physician and then go through that whole rigor mole and the whole, um, you know, insurance process and the whole lack of, uh, you know, um, personalized medicine, all that is, is changing, and accelerating. And I think we can break that system so much faster now. Startups love times of disruption, right? Because the incumbents lose their advantage. So this is a great time to be a startup. Super. Yeah, go, Cable. I was just, I mean, two quick examples on, on your question about counterintuitive. So I think one, to pick up on Jeb's point, we have a company called Common Networks, and they're building an ISP. And 
when was the last time that venture capitalists invested in an ISP? I mean, 20 years ago, uh, when the Telecom Deregulation Act came along, right? And so that, that was my best, by, by the way, it was my best investment ever. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> yeah, but, but look what's happened. I mean, because we're now, I mean, most of the ISP infrastructure all over the world was built for downstream, for, for you know, downstreaming Netflix and videos. But it turns out when the world is upside down, we need two-way bandwidth. You need full duplex, two-way, because we're doing Zoom. Like, look at this call, for example. So long story short, there is an ISP now that's delivering full duplex gigabit per second bandwidth. And that's the kind of ISP that the world will need. So I think there is investments going back. It's almost like turning the clock back to the infrastructure days of the internet when you were building ISPs, mm -hmm. semiconductors, and routers, right? Machine learning and semiconductor is a big revolution. So that's one. The second one I'll say is, I think retail. I mean, the, this, the, you know, the death of the mall and death of retail, I think is premature. I think what's gonna happen with retail is it's gonna get reimagined. We're not going to see the malls that we have seen of the recent past, but we're going to see. Okay, so what investment? Give me an investment that you've made that reimagines retail. Well, I mean, we have an investment in the real deal. We talked about it. I'll give you another one. We have a company called Kuyana, which is a women's fashion brand. It's a direct to consumer fashion brand. So think of Coach, but for the millennials and Gen Z. So the mom, you know, the mother bought Coach, but the daughter's buying Kuyana. Why is Kuyana different? Well, they have a vertically integrated supply chain. So they only, they make, uh, and sell their own products, do not right. distribute it to third parties, direct to consumer, omni-channel. And it's online. not white label? It's not, it's not buying white label? It's not white label. They design, manufacture, and distribute their own products. They don't, it's not manufactured in China, so there's no- so how, how can you scale that? They scale it because they, just like Dell scale PC, so it's, the, these are small batches made to order in a very nimble fashion. So there is no overstock, there is never a discount and they sell to their own distribution channel. So they're doing to fashion what Dell did to personal computing by reinventing a supply chain and going direct to the consumer, getting higher margins. Okay, so but I challenge you, okay, you don't have to take it further. The I point, challenge like, you when you answer. The point, the point that I was trying to make with retail is that I think retail is gonna be like, think about a mall as becoming like Disneyland. If you go to Disneyland, you're going there for the experience. Right. And no matter what entrance you came into the park, you're going to end up going on all the rides. And I think that's the idea of a mall, right? That you come into the mall, but you're going to go visit all the stores. Typically, that doesn't happen. So I think what's going to happen in the, in the future is that all of this idea about everybody working from home and socializing from home, I think it's overdone. I think that people need the human touch, especially the younger you are, the more human touch you need. And people are going to be out back in the real world in droves, and they're going to go to these shopping centers and shopping experiences that look nothing like the mall of today, but they look like Disneyland. And I think that's going to be a huge area of investment and opportunity. I, okay. if, uh, again, Jerry, if I could interrupt for a yeah, second, I, I, just, I just want to agree with that, that uh, you know, this can be a trend enhancer, but I think it's, uh, it's going to be hard put that it's going to fundamentally change human behavior over a long period of time. You know, I think the analogy that I would give is if you are right now, everybody is a, a team member that is not co-located. Um, but if, you know, six months from now, your entire team is once again meeting in the office and you're the only one that's not in the office, you start to suffer the same problems you had before all this started. And so, uh, you know, it, I, I think what I enjoy is the second order effects. It's like, sure, we all wish we had invested in Zoom or is this the death of retail? I've been finding interesting pockets of, of excitement around things like uh, uh, online lottery, because it never occurred to me that because nobody is going to 7-Eleven to buy lottery tickets, the states who are already under huge budget pressure are losing billions of dollars. Texas is losing $4 billion in lottery revenue, which means that online lottery, you know, the, the company I'm thinking of is Jackpocket went from being in three states to 14 states in three months, which basically accelerated their plan by you know, two years. And those are the areas that I think are super interesting. Gambling, thank you very much. No, 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 the second order, <laughs> no, yeah, I agree. The second order effects, right? Second order effects. You gotta dig a little bit deeper to find where, you know, it's like clearly StubHub's gonna die and Zoom's gonna do well during this period, but you gotta look deeper than that. Thank you very much. Good. Sean, you had a question from the chat that you were going to come back. Um, to. Yes, I did, but I think we've kind of covered it. I would go, but let's, let's get somebody involved. Um, 
Let's go to Zafir, Zafir, Z-A-F-E-R. We can unmute. I'm seeing hi. Zafir. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we do. We hear okay. you. Hi. Yeah. So uh, the new norm is remote collaboration, online working, and, and in my view, one industry or the startup uh, system that will be impact is the IoT, uh, more hardware, IoT and robotics related startups, because they will struggle to get together to make progress in their product development. And, and there's a potential risk of missing their uh, milestones. And if that happens, uh, their follow on investors or new investors uh, may be reluctant to, to, uh, to invest more. And the, so, the industry itself can, can suffer. Do you have an example for us? Um, I have some startups, uh, uh, friends startups, and uh, they, they kept missing their milestones and, and now everybody is remote. And their product is incomplete, uh, sitting in a storage or a warehouse. There are several startups in my own network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so I only have a cellular data point from my portfolio, but I have 10 portfolio companies and one is a hardware robotics um, managed service provider. They have a warehouse of robots that we use to digitize paper records and try to unlock value, sort of like a di modern digital Iron Mountain. That's my only company where the employees have gone back to work. Uh, the rest have all worked remote. As an aside, there's a good argument that many of our companies will never go back to the office. Some, many of our companies are letting the leases expire and have no plans to um, you know, sign new ones and uh, work entirely remote. This is the one company where they have had to go back into the office and the warehouse to manage the robots. The team has been amazingly creative in how they have done that and um, the different processes and uh, safety and health related issues. Uh, it does increase the cost burden, but they've been able to make it work. And okay. um, the workforce has embraced it and uh, it's going uh, surprisingly well. So with just a singular data point, uh, they have not been impacted too badly by it. Okay, thank you. So moving to the next question is really about the extent of the shock. We've discussed that extensively, but if this shock is profound, are these adjustments that we're making, I mean, we really heard more of an argument for continuity of trend and opportunity based on externalities, but really trends that were already in place. But in prior uh, you know, economic shocks like 2008 and 2001, you know, 2001 was more sector and 2008 was, you know, more financial. You know, there was a fundamental reset uh, because in 2001, you had a market collapse that, you know, the market essentially didn't really exist yet. It got ahead of itself. You know, with the financial collapse in 2008, you had a fundamental reset in um, the liquidity in the marketplace. But is this kind of shock going to disrupt the LPs, you know, the, uh, the portfolio, um, you know, is, is this a reset? Is this, you know, I haven't heard anybody make the argument for the old Sequoia RIP type of reset. Uh, I think we all know what I'm referring to, that famous PowerPoint presentation to the CEOs um, that really called for triage and buckling down and, and stretching the runway. Um, I'm not hearing that argument from this panel. Is that no? Is not? Does that not really apply? Is it? Is it just triage out the restaurants and and go with the digital? Or and do we think the LPs are going to be there for us going forward? And just a quick shot on that, and then we'll ask our uh, uh, you know our, our attendees their point of view. Uh, no, why don't you give me your thoughts? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do believe that there will be a shakeout and there will be some disenchantment with early stage venture capital coming um, in the, the LP community, the corporate venture community. Um, uh, it, it is a somewhat inevitable <laughs> cyclical pattern where, you know, uh, it, it, because venture capital is, is a lottery system where a small number of companies produce outsized returns, um, you know, a lot of investors don't, you know, don't happen to get into one or a couple of those companies. It, it, it's, uh, it's quite unlike the public markets where 
investors tend to be much more diversified. Um, you know, venture funds just can't diversify that much. And uh, you, you have a cycling in and out, you know, of investors. So I think there will be, you know, a, a washout coming and, you know, the, the years of, you know, $120 billion, you know, new fundraising activity, you know, is, is probably going to, it's going to, you know, it's going to drop. And um, a lot of investors who came in are going to, are going to exit out. Um, does that change things, you know, for um, uh, entrepreneurs? I don't necessarily think so because any new company, you know, is building for a 10 year horizon is trying to, you know, apply secular trends and, you know, um, develop, a, a, innovate around a, a new technology or a new business model. So it doesn't, it doesn't really change. Um, but I, I do think we'll, you know, the, the escalation of valuations and the frequency of hundred million dollar plus rounds, you know, is, is going to, is, is going to fade somewhat, <laughs> you know, in, in, probably in the next year to two year time frame, you know, and before it comes back. So as, as we move to, to cave on jet, I think you're raising an issue for me, at least as I listen to you, is that the timing between valuation inflation and the business catching up with the valuation, um, you know, in a bubble, we always have that valuation inflation, you know, leading. And what is the elasticity of that rubber band? Uh, so will it break on us before we get to see the fundamental business shift underneath it? Uh, Cable, I don't know if that yeah. segues to your comments. I, was just, I mean, I think let's just, yeah. I think what's only different about the time is that the markets, despite the run up in the last 30 days, are still generally sane in terms of valuation. Um, what? Let's look at Apple. So let's look at Apple, right? So I think the bubble is. In Wait, the prime this is market. going to be good. I want to hear this. Go for it. Uh, yeah. So okay, let, let let's look at the most valuable company in the world, which had a record day today, right? So it's worth two trillion dollars market cap, right? Uh, it's one point eight, but let's say two trillion. The revenue of Apple is two hundred and sixty billion a year. So it's ten times sales. Would 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 you pay ten times sales to a product that most of us? use every day and love? Yeah, absolutely. So Zoom might be at 50 times sales, but Apple's 10 times sales. And I think you look at Amazon, same thing, Google, same thing. If you look at the top 10 companies in the world, the multiples are actually quite sane. In fact, one would argue they're still pretty cheap. And when I say that, let me, let me give you one data point, which I, which I just think is mind boggling. So Apple, $2 trillion market cap, 5 billion adults in the world with smartphones. So that's $400 per adult per year. $400 of value per adult per year. That doesn't seem that crazy. And if you bring it down to revenue, $260 billion a year, that's $50 per person per year, globally, $5 billion adult, $5 billion adults, right? So these companies are not crazily valued. Uh, if you that want to talk about crazy. Amazon, one last data point, right? This is my bull case. So this is my ultimate because I do commerce. So. Amazon is what 160. Well, what's Amazon's market cap? Um, 1.5 billion, 1.5 trillion dollars. Amazon's revenue last year, 200 billion dollars. Okay. Uh, but, but look at their margins. I mean, come on. Oh, but so right. So margins are low in the retail business, but cloud business, 80% gross margin, right? So they have a pretty nice plan. But here's the thing, Jerry. Retail overall, we talked about it. retail is a five trillion dollar industry in the U.S. Okay. E-commerce e is only 12% of that. So is Amazon going to have another 10X jump in valuation in the next 20 years? Yes. I would buy Amazon today because they're still a tiny player in this large market. So my point is valuations in the public market are actually okay. It's the private market, which is messed up. And my regret, if I have one regret from this whole crisis, is that, is, that COVID is going to give a lot of us lame VCs who have invested in these very high valued private companies that we're going to go bust anyways, it's going to give us an easy way out because all we have to do is go to LPs and say, you know what? That was the COVID vintage. It was not my fault. And I think that's the number one crop out that LPs should not give us any, any benefit for. I I bad. So I want to hear what Jeb got to say about these, because uh, he's the guy who's buying in at, at Series B and C. So 
how does that thesis hold up with your BNC investing strategy? Well, I agree with Cable that all of our publicly traded portfolio companies are grossly undervalued and have tons of runway ahead of them. So that was a spot on point. But uh, I will say, you know, um, at the Series B and C stage, and we do mostly Series B, uh, it's gotten pretty thin in terms of pipelines. I think uh, what uh, shocks do to the funding um, and capital discipline for companies is it puts a premium back on building capital efficient models, which is great. That's always a um, lens that we look at companies with and we always preach. We've been losing that battle over the last couple of years with the whole unicorn blitz scaling model, which I think um, tends to get a little out of control when, in, in boom markets. And I think so in this environment where you have a return to capital efficiency yet, you know, a very lucrative exit market, I think it's a very healthy environment for startups. So, you know, we have uh, closed two investments. We closed one in the end of March. Uh, we just uh, closed, we should close this week on a second investment. Um, we only do four or five investments a year in a normal market. So we're kind of in the same pace. But that being said, we're looking and evaluating at less companies because I think entrepreneurs are learning to stretch their capital farther. There have been more add-on bolt-on rounds to extend runway to get the unit economics uh, you know, in a palatable shape and a return to discipline in scaling companies, which I think is super healthy for the business. You know, I talked about um, the burden of really exorbitant uh, real estate costs that our companies have been bearing. I think that's going to be impacted in a positive way. I also think there's a lot more efficiency in sales and marketing. This shock has been a dream for CFOs who want the AB test of all those crazy marketing programs that um, yeah. the marketing team required in terms of events and dinners and cocktail hours and all that. And it's proven that a lot of efficiency has been driven into how marketing and sales have been transacted. That's another place our company has been amazingly resilient. Selling, you know, million dollar enterprise deals over Zoom is really hard. It's been a big adjustment for sales teams that were not accustomed to not looking in the whites of the eyes of their customers and they figured out how to do it. So, but I think there's a lot more efficiency in the models now where capital can be stretched much further. Yeah, Jeb, that's a great segue to um, this point that you were very kind to share with me. Uh, and Jerry, just so you know, I've got a number of questions backing up. Yeah, there. we're going we're gonna to come right to them. Uh, I just want to uh, move to this, that Jeb shared this with me last night. I, I literally saw this at 10 o'clock last night, Jeb. You shared it earlier in the day, but I was uh, preparing for the program, so I didn't get to my email. You know you work but, around the clock, Jerry. It's good. I'm not trying to make that point, but this is the, I mean, this was actually great news. I mean, it, it, it's from our friends uh, at your uh, favorite school uh, where Paul Gompers and his buddies put together, you know, a nice survey of well over a thousand institutional and, and corporate venture capitalists. And it made the point, I think that, you know, I, I extracted a few of the points from, uh, from the study and the deals have slowed, uh, you know, they're, you know, somewhat 71% of normal. Uh, these are the expectations of these 5,000 institutional investors. And this is as of August 2020. I mean, this is right now, right? 52% um, of the portfolio companies are positively affected. 38% are negatively affected. And only 10% are severely affected. So the pace is a little slower. People are taking care of business. But by and large, you know, only 10% disasters. Uh, their funds overall, their expectations are uh, not to have dramatic negative impacts from COVID, that uh, their time allocations as individuals is not that changed. They're spending more time working with their individual portfolio companies, but they're still spending time generating deal flow, but that was an area of concern. And they did not see a change in expectations among corporate venture capitalists. So uh, this paper is available online and uh, the link is embedded in these slides as well. So I would recommend everybody pull it down. Not that it's, you know, that these forecasts are accurate, but these are today's expectations of a very large uh, population of institutional investors. Uh, so uh, exactly on cue, Sean, I wanted to go to the questions in the chat and I wanted you to, uh, you know, serve them up for us, please. Yeah, so I'm going to start by being the mouthpiece for Kamal, who has uh, some background noise. Uh, the question is really, so uh, women in uh, venture funded companies and in VC firms uh, are underrepresented. And do we think that this COVID, the changes because of COVID are going to change that? 
uh, or is it just going to be the same um, trend line that it has been prior? Let's punch it out. Noah, you go first. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that there um, there is uh, for sure more attention being placed, you know, on diversity in you know the investment community uh, across the board, and um, every fund I know is trying to recruit a female partner <laughs> and more people of color to the team. So, so I think I think that's you know. The, the intentions are there. Uh, hiring in general is just a lot slower because um, these partnerships, you know, operate on chemistry and uh, um, it, it's really, it's been hard to evaluate, you know, uh, how someone will fit into a team remotely. So I think the hiring has slowed and it, it, it's, it's that transition will, is happening, but it'll, it'll take longer in this environment. Other points of view? I just I, I shared some stats in the chat for everybody, so I won't repeat those. But I think in general, obviously to state the obvious, including this panel, for example, you know, we need a lot more uh, people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, for the one simple reason, if not anything else, is that the consumers are diverse. I mean, if you look at the customer demographic of all of our companies that we fund, there are all kinds of people who use these products and services. So we got to reflect that in investor group and in the entrepreneurs group. And I think that systematically uh, we have a problem. Uh, the good news, if there is one, I think is that there has been slow but steady progress in the last few years. If you look at some of the stats that came out from NVCA uh, earlier this year, I think uh, last year, the number of uh, women investors uh, doubled now from a very, very small percentage base. So uh, not saying much, but, but it's going in the right direction. And I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion within the LP community uh, who ultimately have a lot to say here about the kind of managers they want to fund. Uh, and I think that those are systematic changes that will take some time, but I do think that the wheels of motion are, are moving. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I'm hopeful that this climate will accelerate the trend because I think, you know, as education opens up and uh, changes and uh, there's, you know, starting in the pipeline of, you know, more interest in entrepreneurship and STEM fields, I'm hopeful that that will accelerate the trend as well. Sean. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a number of questions around uh, the impact of COVID on specific sectors. Um, I, I think uh, we'll start with uh, Axel. Blickstead's question for a particular sector. Axel, can you speak up, please? Yes, hi. Good to see you, Professor Engel. Thank you for, for doing this. It's great. So uh, we're seeing more and more um, VCs involved, like uh, a A16Z paradigm involved in the blockchain crypto space. Uh, with all this money printing from the central banks, do you guys see you know, this finally a big change in the financial sector where money you know, will be digitalized and we won't be using our fiat money? As we have been, I mean, this this could be a huge transformation, and not leave you know two to four percent to Mastercard and Visa, and have other different ways of uh, of paying for stuff on a day to day basis. Be very curious on on the. Yeah, is this the is this the crypto moment? Three points of view. For us, not yet. We haven't seen any good enterprise commercial applications beyond sort of a store store value and some money transfer and speculative use cases, but. It's been disappointingly slow in terms of blockchain adoption in, you know, enterprise commercial deployment. So at Series B, we haven't seen very many interesting business plans come through. Mm -hmm. Cable, I would say that Axel, you brought up a few different things in there. I mean, there, there are three related but different items. One is this idea of paying middlemen like Mastercard and Visa. So the idea of having a distributed ledger, where you can have transactions being recorded authentically and you don't need a middleman to verify those. That's one idea. And I think that definitely has a lot of appeal. And there are use cases, especially in the international remittance market that you may have seen where people are doing that with uh, the protocol. And I think the protocol, the tokenization of assets in general, I think is a good idea. It's basically distributed computing, just like TCP IP opened up the internet for everybody. I think the blockchain protocol opens up financial transactions to everybody and makes the cost of transactions lower. So I think that's a clear winner in my mind. The second thing you mentioned was fiat currency. I think it's a totally different, 
diff different bucket. That's another application of the protocol. And I think, you know, obviously Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two big uh, topics there. But I think if you live in Venezuela where the inflation is 1100% a year, yes, I can see that Bitcoin makes a huge amount of sense to put your money in that currency. If you live in the US, inflation is near 0%. I'm not sure. I think it makes sense as part of a broader portfolio diversification strategy, just like people collect stamps and art and gold. Sure. If you want to put 5% of your assets into digital currencies, makes sense to me. But is it going to overtake fiat currency? I don't think so. Uh, and then the last thing ab about, um, I think, financial, financial services in general, I would, I would say that what and by the way, just as a personal opinion, I would never look at other venture firms' um, activities as a leading indicator of anything. There have been many funds, as Jerry can tell you over the years about sector specific. We used to have a mobile you know, era in, in venture where like, you know, if you went down Highway 101, you would see a bunch of firms that are mobile only venture funds. None of them exist anymore. Um, so I think this idea that crypto specific funds are a leading indicator of anything in the market, I don't buy that. But I do buy the fact that financial services as an industry has been actually latecomer to technology innovation. And I think what you're seeing is that the fundamental building blocks, the rails, if you will, of that industry are getting digitized. And that will obviously unleash a wave of innovation and value creation. So I believe in that. Noah, this is your crypto moment, uh, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we, we have backed a company called Mythical that has developed a uh, application for digital goods trading for the gaming world. They uh, published a standard called D-Goods and uh, just signed, a, not announced, but a partnership with uh, one of the largest console providers. Um, so, Let me make sure I understand. Is that a cross-game currency? Uh, it's, it's to enable objects cre created in games um, to be traded. Um, it's a cross-game currency, which is illegal. In-game in or out-of-game. It's up to the <laughs> publisher. Yeah, it's up to the publisher to create a currency or use a common currency. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, but it's not, they, they are not issuing. It's a great idea. I, I, I mean, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm interrupting you. But as you know, gaming to me is a passion relative on the business side. And I'm waiting for the best cross game platform like this. And yeah. I didn't know yeah, about I think this. I think it's it waiting to happen. happen. It is. Uh, yeah. And I, I, to, uh, to Jeb's point, um, you know, we, we've met with hundreds and hundreds of crypto startups and um, uh, this was one where we did see a real business model, you know, potential for a large market. And it wasn't just dependent on specu speculation in the cr cryptocurrency. I also just mentioned um, uh, follow, following on the question that there's uh, there is a, a push among central banks to actually issue fiat currency digitally. And there's a company here in Oakland called uh, eMint that uh, is trying to be the uh, essentially the printing press um, for digital currency for central banks. Um, they're, they're backed by OMDR networks. Um, Fantastic. So it, a takeaway from this is uh, uh, crypto is not going to replace fiat. You know, that's not the moment. Uh, U.S.-based investors uh, might do it as a small diversification strategy, but those fund-specific um, uh, opportunities may be too narrow or too tight. But if we look, this is a secondary effects argument, Sean. If we look at the secondary effects of digital trading and not just currency per se, there may be massive opportunities and currency is included in them. I really appreciate that. Sean, next issue. Um, uh, I think instead of talking about some other verticals, let's switch gears a little bit. And um, we've had a number of questions about uh, differences in geography and geographic impacts. I think I'm gonna go to Ross Cameron for this question. Come on in, Ross. Thanks. So my question was around emerging markets and developing regions of the world. Specifically coming out of COVID, are there investments, specific investments that any of you have or things you're excited about, opportunities you'd see for accelerated growth or leapfrogging in those regions compared to a developed market like the United States? Ross, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that and um, go beyond the panel here uh, because I want to hear from the panel for sure. But I want to invite everybody 
online right now to throw into the chat, raise your hand if you have a response to Ross's question, which is about, you know, geo-specific uh, COVID-related strategies. Okay, so open for the panel, any reactions? So I'll give one example. Um, uh, and it's a very, it's a, <laughs> Uh, one of our, it's one of our investments. It's a company called Cambly, C-A-M-B-L-Y. And what they do, it's an online language learning platform. And specifically, they focus on English. So anybody who wants to learn English, they can use the app or the website to find a tutor and off they go. Now, you would think that that's not a really big business. Like how, how, how many people in the world want to learn English? Well, it turns out everybody who's not an English speaker wants to learn English. And the reason they want to do that is because it, learning English provides better economic opportunities for the most part. And so that's a business where in this COVID era, because everybody's sitting at home and has access to um, Wi-Fi or broadband, that's a huge spike in demand. Yeah. And yeah. an entire generation of people who are not native English speakers are learning to speak English because they believe that by becoming proficient in English, they'll get better economic opportunities wherever they are in the world. So that's one example. Yeah, I, well, I can throw, just double down on that for a second. Uh, not a venture invested or, you know, is it more of an angel investment uh, funded company? But one of our Berkeley companies, Magoosh, is a uh, test prep company. And you might not think the test prep relates to that specific issue, but it does. Because a lot of um, people around the world use test preparation as a way of not just preparing for a test, but really improving your English, English language skills because a lot of tests are uh, provided in English. So in a way, Magoosh or companies like that um, are really international plays uh, around the English Englishization of uh, certain sectors of society. I did not see anybody else respond in the chat. I agree with that, Jerry. On the consumer side of our portfolio, like companies like Quizlet and Visco, I mean, they're seeing as much adoption and traction in uh, international markets as they do in the U.S. I think all consumer companies quickly become global. You know, you don't really bifurcate the world as much anymore as we used to. Right. I, I just wanted to add, so I invest internationally in fintech companies, and uh, it, it's so, so right now we're talking about companies that are U.S. based that are, you know, potentially heading to other countries. I think um, what I'm seeing, and I mean, we have people on this call from so many different countries that are far more expert than me. Is, you know, there's a huge amount of variation in what's a good investment right now um, in the time of COVID, depending on the country. So, you know, in fintech, we have countries that are doing repayment moratoriums on loans, right? So. Uh, you know, I've got companies in my portfolio that are like off 80% in the repayment rates and long term also quite scary because it turns out that once people get used to not paying their bills, even when they're forced to again, they're, un, you know, there's some amount of people who decide they just enjoy not paying their bills. Um, so uh, I, I guess where I'm headed is, is I think COVID is quite lumpy, not just because of the health situation, but also the, the response of each of these governments. So it's really hard to give a general uh, uh, statement about how it's affecting country by country. I'm going to reach out and call on Douglas. Douglas, I see you're in the room and you're located in the UK right now. You've come off mute. Uh, just, is there anything from a UK perspective, because you're an active investor and you see a lot of deals, you know, is there anything UK-ish about COVID that uh, is particular? Yeah, I, I think there is, listening to the responses, I think there are two things that come out. One is that there is a globalization and a global need for certain things during COVID, where, which we all share, and I'll come to that. But before I get to that, I think there's also the more negative side, which is um, what are we seeing in terms of how different countries react to COVID? So I will talk specifically about the UK in a moment, Jerry, but one thing that we see is because we're, we get a lot of capital in from America, we also get a lot of capital in from China. And, you know, the, the tensions that have arisen out of COVID have really exacerbated and accelerated the breakdown in trust between the West and China. And for us as venture capitalists, this means that every company in Britain right now that's looking to raise money is trying to decide, do we take money from Americans or do we take money from the Chinese? And if they take money from the Chinese, 
there's a real concern that it may mean that they're locked out of uh, American funding and American markets. So COVID wasn't the start of that, but the way in which China has uh, used its uh, monopoly, perhaps, of uh, medical supplies, PP and so on, and testing equipment, uh, the way that America has used uh, the propaganda, or the, or the Trump has used the propaganda value of attacking China for creating the disease, has certainly speeded up that. Um, in terms of opportunities, though, then I think in Britain, the biggest opportunity that we're seeing outside of the, the vaccine is on testing. Because in the West, but particularly in Britain, particularly in America uh, and in Latin America, the failure to really get the track and trace working means that there's a huge opportunity now investing in the different types of companies that are advancing technology so fast in, uh, in testing for whether or not people have got the antibodies, testing for people whether or not they've actually got the current, uh, currently infected, and also all that means with biosecurity. And, and that really is very exciting opportunity uh, for us. So that's, that's the positive side. Thank you for that. Hey, Mitchell. Uh, I'm going to wake you up for a minute. I see you here on the screen. Uh, Mitchell is a corporate investor, and I, you can introduce yourself real quickly, but the question I want to ask you is not geospecific, uh, but you certainly look at global opportunities on, on behalf of HP, et cetera, but uh, I want to ask you about what you see in your corporate colleagues, not necessarily at HP specifically, but COVID lens uh, on corporate investing from you and your colleagues. So I've, I've seen some slowdown. You know, I think the CFO is nervous about the optics of investing in companies that aren't us. So, you know, we're, we're going into a period where a lot more diligence and a lot more slow than we could do before. I hear that from colleagues as well. Um, from an international standpoint, I don't think that's changed. You know, we're still getting deal flow and information from all kinds of places. Sticking to our knitting closer, I think, is another thing that's happened. You know, some brought up track and trace. I think that's a big piece for us now. Being able to track all kinds of things beyond the medical stuff. You think about everything that's got to now be tracked and followed and accurately figured out where it is and delivered uh, has become just blown up for everybody. So uh, that's been something that we've been seeking and looking at. But I think for the most part, um, just reaching out and staying with our syndicates has been a little more difficult. And we're all kind of like trying to keep in touch with each other and figure out who's doing what with who and are we missing something that it's much harder to track with just doing Zoom meetings. So a real quick question. Uh, you know, a big part, you've taught me over the years that a big part of your process, you have a lot more bureaucratic internal steps and alignment than a strictly financial institutional VC would have. And institutional VC might be having to get agreement or consensus among four, five, six, eight people to make an investment. Um, you would have to get hierarchical alignment. So not just is it harder to reach out for deal flow perhaps, but how has uh, your internal corporate process been affected and has that affected your ability to close deals? No, it, it hasn't changed that. What it has done though, is it stepped up our interest in commercialization side of the, of the plate. You know, we, we do both that business development commercialization side as well as the investment side. And I think there's a, a sense from the executive team that there's bargains to be had. So let's go out there and find that. And anything that smells like you can help somebody from this, this work from home kind of situation, we're all living with this new friction. We've discovered all, how horrible it is or whatever the situation is. We're all living with a new set of frictions. So where are the startups that are trying to solve those problems? Where are the startups that are making collaboration better? Where are the startups that are, are making, you know, we had audio problems in the background with one of the screens. How come we haven't found things, if it's not a human voice, to take that out, whether it's with AR or MO or something? What are all the things that make this experience better and where can HP step in and do something about that currently now and you know, for the next four years? So I think that focus of turning the corporation and looking at that, making sure we're not missing an inflection point and all the, the sources inside the company have definitely become focused on that. So thank you for that, Mitchell. Very insightful. I, before turning to the panel for summation comments, and I wanna get uh, the polling mechanism 
give that exercise one more time to sort of get a closing sentiment from the group. I'm going to ask some questions that we may uh, reflect on for general sentiment, and some of them may be sound familiar because I'm going to re-poll on some similar questions that we asked in the beginning. But after we've had this discussion, synthesize it all and please lean in and let's respond to the poll over the next 15 to 30 seconds over the next investment cycle. And I just arbitrarily said that's three years, but that's sort of my personal time horizon. Um, the rate of new funds coming into venture capital. In other words, will we see new monies? I, by funds, I didn't mean fund structures, but I meant dollars or euros. Is it going to accelerate are people going to increase their allocations, decrease their allocations? We've got 23 people responding. I want to see 50. I want to see 100. Let's go. Let's go. Wow. We have just, you know, a spread across the board that is inconclusive. We have a third, a third, a third. I've never seen anything so conclusive with 72 responding literally we have that 30 33 and 36 percent nobody there's not any clear point of view expressed with over 100 people attending on uh whether things are going to accelerate or not it's all everybody's still uh, spread across the board so what do we think about returns let's go to the next poll do we think returns are going to be better or worse than expectations? So that's a good question, what the hell are expectations? But um, given whatever the mindset was in February, what do you think? Are they gonna be better or worse? And people think they're gonna be worse. So far with 58 to 121, yeah, worse is taking on more steam. For half of the people in the room think they're going to be worse. So I think that, you know, if this was an election, we'd call the election. So it's been a good conversation. Uh, Sean, I want to give you a chance to uh, start this sort of wrap up discussion. Um, great, great. But I, and I, the questions I want to sort of look at I mean, I want to preserve time for this question about what would you do tomorrow? And that's a polling question. But I want to reserve time for that. But um, I, want to, I want to go around and hear sort of this point of view. So Sean, I'm going to come to you first and sort of, what have you heard uh, today? I'm not really asking for your point of view, but what you've heard. Uh, I'm, I'm going to synthesize it in the following way. Uh, one of the great upsides that is going to come from all this turmoil that we are going through is that uh, as we see when we're talking about these different industries, when we're talking about the rebirth or reimagining of retail, whatever it might be, is that we are all entrepreneurs now. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you, before COVID, you considered yourself an entrepreneur or not. When you have as much change as we have today going across so many sectors of the, of the economy and the world, we are all entrepreneurs now. So there's good news and bad news in that. The bad news is just like any entrepreneur, it's uncomfortable, it's unsettling, it's risky. Um, uh, the future is not as clear as it used to be. But on the upside, we're gonna end up building, I think, uh, a, a better economy, a better set of tools, um, higher productivity, better standards of living um, once we, and, and a culture where more and more of us understand how to be an entrepreneur, whether you're inside a corporation or you're actually an entrepreneur. Um, and so I see great hope coming out of this that culturally we're going to change in a, in a direction that I think everybody on this panel is um, committed their lives to, basically. Noah, what have you heard in the discussion today, and do you agree or disagree with it? Um, yeah, I, I, well, I think I've heard a lot of reasons for optimism, and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's no denying that um, many of the fundamental impacts of the pandemic have actually benefited the tech companies and the tech sector 
and many of the trends that, that already, you know, um, startups were driving, you know, and growth companies were driving, um, you know, and I think that is, those remain long-term positives, you know, those successes are the reason why there's been a flood of capital right in, into the venture sector. And uh, I do think that more capital will, you know, does compress returns um, and uh, you can't escape it. And there's going to be a fading of returns for a while and probably some cycling out of capital, you know, before it comes back again. Um, does that change, you know, how we act as investors? Does it change how entrepreneurs build their businesses? Um, uh, not from that long-term perspective. Uh, I think we actually work hard to try to tune out macro factors <laughs> in, to a certain degree when we make new investments because, you know, we have to remind ourselves, well, this is a company that will exit, you know, in five to 10 years, you know, and uh, we can't be trying to decide, you know, based on what the stock market, you know, did this week you know, um, whether it's going to succeed. Uh, but I do, I do think that ability to ride out the storm is important. And, and from an operating standpoint, companies need to remain disciplined and remain, you know, keep, keep tight control on their costs um, for the next year to year and a half. Fantastic. Cable, what did you hear? And do you agree and dis or disagree with it? You know, what I heard, Jerry, is that in the short term, there is massive disruption and, and death, literally. Uh, but in the long term, there is tremendous opportunity and value creation. Uh, unprecedented, that word gets used a lot recently, but I think unprecedented in human history because of the fact that everybody is going to be digitized in touch with digitization in whatever activity we're doing on a daily basis. So whether it's healthcare education, you know, commerce, um, everything we do is going to get digitized. So that and the TAM is just going to be unimaginably good. So I think that's what I heard. Uh, I think Sean summarized it well, that entrepreneurship is going to become, and you've been teaching this, Jerry, for 30 years or longer now, entrepreneurship is going to become the way of life. I think that that, to me, is a big, big, big social change. And it's going to be for the mostly for the good. It's going to create more efficient systems of resource allocation and human productivity and human achievement. The one thing that I didn't hear, and I think that's the underlying current that I've been thinking about. And I think if I you know, travel the world, as you know, I grew up in India and you know, I live in the US for the last 30 years, a citizen here now. But I think that the underlying current across the world is social unrest. And if you think about why that is, I think we, in this conversation, we can bring it to, to cap tables. I mean, think about the disparity between the top 1%. When we look at a cap table of a company that we all fund, that we're running, look at the equity that goes to the founders and the executive team and the equity that goes to the rest of the employees. There's this huge, huge, huge gap. And that I think is something that we need to tackle as a society. And I think this group here, that's a global group can, can play an influential role in that. Because I think if we don't tackle this disparity of wealth, then there is this situation that is real, that 99% of the people on the planet are not participating in that wealth creation. And that is not gonna be a sustainable thing for any of us. So I do believe that irrespective of which side of the political spectrum we all fall under, we gotta fix this disparity in, in the wealth creation gap. Well said. Jeb, what, what have you heard? And do you agree or disagree with it? So I really enjoyed this today. Thank you for the opportunity. And it's nice to be able to step back and, uh, you know, have a more macro perspective versus the daily grind we go through. And, you know, other than cable bringing us down a little bit there, uh, we had a lot of optimism on this call, which I think there's a lot of things to be uh, very enthusiastic, excited about. I really do believe that startups thrive in periods of disruption. So I think we're fortunate in the tech healthcare entrepreneurial environment that I think we have a really wonderful opportunity ahead. And I think the points Cable raised are spot on. And I think the engagement level and the level of questions around the table and the fact that you're doing this, right? I think this is fantastic. You have a group of high powered execs all around the world on a call together for an hour and a half where you probably wouldn't have been able to do this if we had all tried to fly and get here together, right? So an opportunity to listen and learn and engage with um, some really uh, awesome questions in the chat and the like. And 
you know, certainly from my standpoint, please reach out if there's anything else we can help with or any other questions we can help uh, answer. Feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or I'll, I'll stick my email in the chat. And, you know, if we can follow up with any of these discussions, I'm happy to do so. But thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Jeb. I know you speak for everybody on the panel. And uh, thank you all. The, um, you know, these are some thoughts. See, I'm not going to do these polls, but these are questions that you might have had. Um, you know, what would you focus on today if today was the first day rather than the hundredth day of your career or whatever? Uh, you know, Steve Jobs has this quote that uh, I look myself in the mirror every morning and I say, what am I going to do today? And if it's not what I really wanted to do with my life, I should do something different. So that's the purpose of this question. You know, if you were starting a fund today, you know, what stage would you focus on? And there are a lot of things that are being said in the venture community. These are all things that are some positive and some negative. The green, you can reflect on these maybe later when I distribute the slides and, or if you want to pull them down. But we hear everything from, uh, you know, things are great and they're going to be just fine. It's a great opportunity for the digital economy and the digital transformation that was going to happen anyway. Uh, you know, all the way through to, oh my God, we got to, some people feel we have to triage and cut back. Um, the disruption is going to last for a long time. And other people look to the amount of money in the venture ecosystem that's been allocated, that's still in dry powder, that is available for future investment, and that we can be confident that we're going to come through this transition, harvesting and supporting the best opportunities. But I do agree. No, but, and I do agree that today, building our little community here and having this digital exchange is one example. As Jeb said, we couldn't all have come together physically and we came together virtually. So it's an example of recalibrating, of not hunkering down and just uh, you know, building a wall but it's leaning in and trying to take advantage of the change and the disruption. And that's all our opportunities. So recognizing that we're all undertaking this challenge of managing these transitions, I want to uh, just express my appreciation for everybody, not, you know, our panel, of course, and uh, the UC Berkeley Executive uh, Education Group, who have facilitated this discussion, but also everybody on the call, the more than 150 people that you know, came online and shared their view. The chat conversation was fantastic. I was challenged to keep up with the chat conversation, um, you know, as well as our, our real live conversation, but I know a number of us did. I saw a number of the panelists also uh, contributing to the chat. Sean, you did a masterful job of helping us engage with it. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor Preet, thank you very much to you and your organization. And again, I want to just thank everybody for helping us build this community and enrich it. I don't want to be able to sustain it. Uh, we do have, um, you know, some events scheduled. Of course, we have our normal venture capital executive program that does continue. It continues online. Um, so if there are colleagues that you think would benefit from joining our community, please encourage them to enroll. We're happy to have them. And I am planning for six months from now to do another summit. And I don't know if it'll come to fruition. I, this next one will. But my hope is that uh, on a regular pace, whether it's every six months or every year, but on a regular pace, we have these conversations among us. Uh, we all share the same language, we all share the same values, but we come from very diverse backgrounds and we have very different perspectives and we have a great opportunity to learn from each other. So thank you very much for this conversation. And with that, I wish everybody a good day and good evening wherever you are in the world. See you soon. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you.